Hello and welcome to another instalment of History Hack. Alina is fangirling again. Alina, I'm just going to hand it over to you. Who do we have? Today we have the fabulous classicist and ancient historian Catherine Edwards. She's a professor of classics and ancient history at Birkbeck and is a specialist in Roman cultural history and Latin literature, particularly Seneca the Younger. Uh, she's published many books in translation, including Suetonius's Life of the Caesars. You may also remember her from the TV, uh, from TV hosting her own programme about the women of Rome, uh, which is what we're going to be talking a little bit about today. I'm incredibly lucky to have been taught by her and to have her on our podcast today. So thank you and welcome. Well, thank you very much indeed, Alina and Alex, for inviting me um, to, to join you on your podcast. It's a very exciting development. We always get very excited about ancient history. Um, how is lockdown? Whereabouts are you? London, I guess. I am at home in London. I'm very lucky. I've, I'm, I'm at home with my family. Everyone's well. Um, and we've been doing a lot of cooking um, and hanging out in our garden. So we're, we're in a very fortunate situation compared to a lot of people. Yes, I think it's people with gardens versus people without at the moment, isn't it? The people without, I think, are liable to be struggling. I mean, it's supposed to hit, I mean, we're recording this a little bit in advance. It's supposed to hit the 20s this week in terms of temperature. So I think people are going to struggle. Yeah, so I do hope they keep the parks open because it is really important that people without their own open space can, can get outside, I think. Yeah, we just hope that these idiots that think that that's a license to go and light a barbecue and sunbathe um, kind of get what's going on and understand the gravity of at least maintaining being like of progressing through the park and using it to do your hour of exercise um, in a sensible way and not just flouting lockdown and putting everybody at risk, basically. Yeah. yeah. Catherine, I want to have a quick question. How's it going at Birkbeck with the, all, the, all these changes? Well, um, we've had to adapt very quickly to the changes. Um, the last two weeks of term, we, we switched to um, teaching, not, we, we suspended face-to-face -face teaching and tried to do it the, our best kind of teaching via various different online tools, which was a, a steep learning curve for uh, Luddites like me who are not terribly used to these things. But um, I mean, you know, I think some of, our, um, some of my efforts worked better than others, but, but at least we've been able to keep in touch with students via, you know, remotely via Collaborate and Zoom and things like that. So at least some of our business is kind of carrying on as usual insofar as people's personal circumstances permit that. Do you know what? Let's let's get talking a bit about some of these women. So I decided to go down this road of two incredible women and their fates are quite intertwined. So let's start with Agrippina. Can you tell us a little about her and who she was? Well, I think Agrippina is kind of my favourite of the Roman Imperial women. Um, she is really a very formidable person. She was born in the year 15 AD um, in what's now Cologne in Germany. And her family were there because her father was the um, very um, talented Roman general Germanicus, who was the, the nephew and adopted son of the Emperor Tiberius. Um, and she was there, all her family were there, including her, her mother, um, obviously, because she was born there, um, the elder Agrippina. And the elder Agrippina was herself the granddaughter of Rome's first emperor, the Emperor Augustus. So they were really a kind of very very much a power couple, um, absolutely at the centre of the of the imperial family. Um, Agrippina wasn't their only child. They had um, three uh, three boys and three girls. So Agrippina had three brothers and two sisters. Now, um, Agrippina's early life um, was, you know, very much one of of, of sort of um, momentous events. The the, the family. Um, not, uh, went off to, to Syria where her father had another important commission but he died there in the year 19, there was a big scandal around the death of Germanicus um, and the rest of the family returned to Rome. Um, now back in Rome Agrippina's mother um, seems to have been on quite bad terms with the Emperor Tiberius and his mother Livia who were sort of dominant people back in Rome um, and so that, that, for instance, um, she asked Tiberius for permission to remarry and Tiberius said no, um, thinking she was sort of giving herself airs and maybe setting herself up 
you know, setting her family up to perhaps um, bid for imperial power. Um, and indeed, two of Agrippina's brothers ended up, you know, initially their careers were promoted, but then they fell out of favour, and both of them came to a premature end. And um, Agrippina's mother ended up in exile, um, and she died there in the year 33. So, you know, lots of, uh, lots of tragic events in the family. Um, Agrippina herself managed to sort of steer clear of, of, um, of difficulty um, to, to a degree. And in the year 28, she was married off at the tender age of 13, rather mind-bogglingly, to a Roman aristocrat called Domitius Ahina Barbus. Um, and her, her younger brother Caligula also managed to stay in favour with Tiberius. And indeed Caligula became joint heir to the emperor along with a younger cousin in the year 31. So, so that's the kind of early life of Agrippina. Um, speaking of Caligula, Suetonius states that Agrippina and her sisters had sexual relations with him. How much truth is there in this statement? Whoa, well, I mean, Caligula is one of those emperors about whom there are all kinds of kind of very scandalous stories. Um, now, it's pretty clear that Caligula was very close to his three sisters. We shouldn't be surprised by that, given that the rest of the family, their parents and their two brothers, had suffered a range of premature and violent deaths. Um, so, you know, there the, the was a sort of strong bond between the surviving family members. When Caligula himself became emperor uh, in the year 37, he conferred special honours on his sisters, um, including the rights of the Vestal Virgins. And that was the sort of thing that the emperors often did to their female relatives. Augustus, um, Rome's first emperor, had given similar rights to his sister Octavia, as well as to his wife Livia. So that's not a kind of completely unprecedented thing to do. Um, uh, Caligula minted a coin in the year 38, which depicted his three sisters um, as, as, as the kind of um, uh, personifications of security, concord and fortune. And, and their names were also on, on the coin. And that's actually really interesting because that's the first imperial coin which showed living women um, and had their names on. So that's kind of quite a significant moment. Um, now, one sister, Drusilla, died in the year 38 and um, there's certainly stories that Caligula was devastated by her death. Uh, Seneca, who was contemporary with Caligula, describes him as very restless with grief, kind of didn't quite know what to do with himself. Um, he didn't go to her funeral, but then he went around founding temples and shrines to her so that she might be worshipped. So Drusilla is deified and, and obviously that must, you know, pl play into the, the idea of, of a very particular relationship between Caligula and his sister Drusilla. Later on, um, the other two sisters, Livilla and Agrippina, are actually sent into exile. Um, they're accused of involvement in a plot against Caligula, um, which involved adultery with um, Drusilla's husband Lepidus. Now I really haven't yet got to the stories about incest and that's partly because those sort of stories actually come quite late in the tradition. So um, we, Suetonius in his biography of Caligula has all these rumours about Caligula's incestuous relations with his sisters, particularly Drusilla, that their grandmother Antonia found them in bed together, all sorts of very lurid detail. And we do find also similar stories in Josephus, the historian Josephus and in Cassius now, but all three of those historians are writing considerably after the event, um, and what we don't find is references to these stories about incest cropping up in those writers, particularly Seneca and Philo, who were actually Caligula's <coughs> contemporaries. So contemporaries, um, you know, don't, don't comment on the story, and that I think does perhaps suggest that um, what we're seeing here is, is the kind of I suppose the, the, the sorts of scandalous tales that tend to attach themselves to emperors who are regarded as sort of tyrannical and excessive. Um, I mean, we'll see later, there's also stories about incest attached to the Emperor Nero. I have vague recollections of a Helen Mirren film called Caligula that was banned because it was basically a mass orgy. So I'm guessing, if nothing else, all of those later um, unsubstantiated reports gave us that. Well, absolutely. No, no. And yeah, I mean, there's stories about, you know, how he always had one of his sisters next to him um, at banquets and got up to all sorts of, you know, 
bad behavior at the table and, and so on. But I think we have to be very skeptical about those kinds of stories. It was Caligula's reign is very brief. Um, he's assassinated. He's got lots of enemies. So it's, it's not surprising to find those stories circulating. He's actually quite exciting. I mean, we could go on about, about Caligula, but we're here to talk about the women. Um, I'm, we're going to put Agri Agrippina aside just for a moment okay. because I want to bring in Messalina into the story because I find her quite interesting and I want to know a bit more about her, who she was, and then we'll come back to Agrippina uh, further on. Absolutely. Okay. Well, um, as we've already mentioned, Caligula's reign was very short-lived. He's assassinated in the year 41 um, on the initiative um, and, and various people are involved in the conspiracy against him. Um, and then on the initiative of the Praetorian Guard, his uncle, Claudius, becomes emperor. That's uh, Claudius was the brother of Germanicus, who was father of Caligula and also of Agrippina. Um, now, Claudius at this point is in late middle age. He's got no military career. Um, now, Messalina is his third wife, um, and she's a good kind of a wife to have if you're wanting to, um, I suppose, uh, establish your position as, as a kind of plausible emperor, because she's also very well connected. She's descended from Augustus's sister, Octavia, and from um, Mark Antony. So she too has a very sort of prestigious family. So, um, Claudius marries Messalina, and together they have two children, Octavia and Britannicus. Um, now, that's a, so in some ways their marriage is a success, but there are also all kinds of stories about Messalina as, as a person, um, which are not so flattering. How does Messalina hold on to her position as the wife of Claudius? Uh, well, I mean, having two children is obviously um, an excellent uh, start so so she's produced an heir for Claudius um, she is supposedly uh, um, very manipulative of Claudius and the the sources um, we don't we don't have a Tacitus account of of, um, of all of Claudius's reign but um, the the, the, the stories in, that we do have in Tacitus and um, in Suetonius present Claudius as very much the victim of um, of, of manipulation on the part of, of his wives and his freedmen, his ex-slave um, advisors. So she uh, comes across in the sources as, as manipulating Claudius and using her, her influence over him to get rid of anyone she sees as being a possible threat. So, uh, for instance, she's reported to have persuaded Claudius to send his niece, Julia Livilla, that's another one of Caligula's sisters, into exile. Um, this poor woman had only just come back from exile. She goes into exile again, and that she's then executed. And allegedly, that was for, well, that's for a, alleged adultery with the philosopher Seneca. So, my man Seneca, who we'll um, be coming back to later, um, he, he doesn't get executed. He just gets to spend for eight years in exile but um so so that's messalina's doing allegedly um she's also said to have uh, um coveted the the property of various wealthy romans um a man called valerius asiaticus is convicted of treason so that messalina can get hold of his gardens uh, the wonderful gardens of lucullus the sort of fabled gardens were um were established in the late republic by by lucullus so so she's a uh, uh, According to uh, the accounts that we have of the reign of Claudius, Messalina is very good at manipulating him. So earlier you mentioned there were some some tr like rumours and things about Messalina. She was called, if I'm not mistaken, the Empress Prostitute. Yeah. Is there, is there any truth in this? Well, again, you know, we're, we're dealing with the, the sort of swirling rumour a factory of, of the Roman imperial court. Um, there are all sorts of stories associated with Messalina that allege um, all kinds of sexual um, misbehavior on her part. So um, she's allegedly um, having an affair with an actor called Menester um, and, and stories about um, aristocratic Roman women having r relationships with, with actors and gladiators are very much you know the stuff of Roman satire um, and indeed it's the satirist Juvenal who famously calls her empress prostitute he calls her Meritrix Augusta and he describes her you know flagrantly 
um, outrageous behavior uh, as she um, competes with Rome's leading prostitutes. And this is a story that also comes in the Elder Pliny. And the Elder Pliny is normally a very sort of sober kind of um, recorder of, 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 of kind of details about different kinds of marble and so on. But um, in, in book 10, he talks about the 24 hour competition that Messalina had with one of Rome's leading prostitutes when she won with a score of 25 sexual partners in that time. So, so these are really extreme stories about, you know, just the worst possible behavior that you could associate with the emperor's wife. So um, now, uh, who can say what truth there is in those stories, but they certainly captured the imagination of um, Romans of that time and later. Um, there was also a very big scandal concerning her relationship with a man called Gaius Silius. Now, Gaius Silius was a, a Roman aristocrat, consul, um, and, and, but allegedly, uh, Messalina, captivated by Silius, decided that she was going to um, get married to him, although she was obviously at the time married to the Emperor Claudius. Um, and that, uh, um, there's a story of, of, of their, their kind of, um, their, their sort of marriage. Um, and um, Tastus tells it in a way as to, to kind of underline the obliviousness of the Emperor Claudius. He's got no clue what's going on. Um, meanwhile, his wife is sort of shipping out the furniture from their house to Silas's house and, and so on. Um, now, uh, on the one hand, that's a sort of, you know, another dramatic story of, of scandalous behaviour. I mean, potentially, if we wanted to look for a grain of truth that might lie behind that, I mean, possibly we could see... Um, Silius as, as kind of having an ambition to replace Claudius um, as emperor, um, you know, to adopting his son Britannicus or, or whatever. I mean, we could see that as, as, as kind of, you know, maybe in the minds of Messalina and Silius, but, you know, it's, that's kind of hard to, to get at the truth um, in, this, in this case. She sounds kind of fun. If all of these things were true, I think she'd make a really great drinking partner. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm, I'm sure she would make a very great drinking partner. She'd, uh, I'm sure, have some good stories and be entertaining company. Um, let's bring Agrippina back into the story because um, I'm curious as to uh, how they wind together. So, when does she emerge back into the records, and what implications are there for Messalina? Right, so Agrippina um, had been, um, as we saw earlier, sent into exile by her brother Caligula, uh, but she's recalled from exile at the start of Claudius's reign in 41, um, along with her sister who then ends up going back into exile. But Agrippina um, seems not to have got into difficulties over the next few years. She's back in Rome with her son Nero, who was born in 38. Um, and so they're in Rome in 47. She, it, it's possible that um, her first husband seems to have died um, and she seems to have been married to another man, Passianus, who also died in the, in the, in the 40s. And so she's, you know, back on the scene. Um, and Tacitus suggests, and indeed Suetonius as well, that there's quite a significant tension between Agrippina on the one hand and Messalina, Claudius's wife, on the other. Now, Messalina may very well have been anxious that Agrippina's son, who's after all directly descended from the Emperor Augustus, Rome's first emperor, that Agrippina's son Nero could be the focus for a bid for power. Now, it's true that Messalina herself had a son, Britannicus. He's a few years younger than, um, than Agrippina's son. Uh, indeed, Suetonius has a story that Messalina actually sent assassins to kill the young Nero, but they were frightened off by the sight of a snake apparently guarding his cradle. So, I mean, he, uh, that's almost certainly the kind of story that's invented, you know, after the fact to, to kind of give spice to the, the, the kind of alleged rivalry between Agrippina and Messalina. But I think it's nevertheless quite an interesting one, kind of focusing on the potential danger that Messalina identifies in the person of... I want to know what happens to Messalina. Well, um, poor old Messalina, she really has kind of overstepped, um, uh, you know, she's, she's rather um, exceeded what even she could get away with. And I think the, the, the real problem for Messalina was that she'd alienated Claudius's freedmen, the ex-slave advisors who are also very close to him and have a lot, lot of influence over him. So um, once, you know, Narcissus had, had kind of... Um, 
you know, taken against Messalina and decided that she was really impossible, um, they, the, the freedmen get Claudius to, um, to get rid of her. So poor old Messalina, she ends up receiving um, a message that she has to kill herself. Um, so there she is in her, in her gardens um, and uh, she's forced to take her own life. Wow. Um, how does she do it? And, and with her dead, um, how does Agrippina then suddenly become Claudius's next wife? Well, um, it's a, um, Messalina is, um, I mean, I think she, she kills herself with a knife, allegedly, but um, as, as a sort of very common um, Roman means of, of dispatching oneself. Um, but once Messalina's out of the way, um, then there's a, a rather unseemly kind of competition to see who's going to become Claudius's next wife, his, his fourth wife. Um, and there's several possible candidates. Um, so one of them is Aelia Paetina, who's Claudius's ex-wife, and that's a candidate uh, favoured by Narcissus. So, you know, you've been married to her before, you know, and he says, so, you know, give it another go. Then there's Lollia Paulina, who's Caligula's ex-wife, and she's, um, her, her champion freedman is Callistus, and then finally Agrippina. And Agrippina's case is um, championed by Pallas, who's perhaps the most powerful of Claudius's freedmen, and that's clearly the, you know, that that's a significant factor. Um, and Pallas argues that you know Agrippina already has a son, so she's got proven fertility. Um, now there's a bit of a catch with Agrippina, and that is that that she is, after all, Claudius's niece. So you know that's perhaps even for Romans a bit unseemly for an, a marriage between uncle and niece, and indeed they have to have a, a special piece of senatorial legislation to kind of make this marriage um, acceptable within the terms of, of Roman law. So um, it's a complicated negotiation. However, in the end, um, they are married in the year 49, in January 49. So Agrippina is now married to her uncle Claudius and she is, you know, has attained a position of incredible power. Um, and and a kind of a, a measure of that is the fact that in the year 50, um, Agrippina is given the title Augusta and she is the first wife of a living emperor who actually gets that title formally. Um, now, it's a title that Livia had previously had, but only after the death of Augustus. So, um, and, and we saw actually that, that later writers um, ironically talk about, you know, Messalina as Meritrix Augusta, but she didn't actually have that title in a, Augusta in a formal sense. That only comes to Agrippina in the year 50. How does she how does she hold on to this power? Because she ends up being an incredibly powerful woman in Rome. Well, absolutely. And and she seems to be I mean the the, the um the fact that Claudius is is kind of um seems to be slightly sort of you know head in the clouds he'd rather be buried in his books or whatever he's not keeping a, a close eye on things Agrippina however is keeping a close eye on things so um it looks as though or we're told that she um kind of schemes to make sure that new appointments in the Praetorian Guard are people who are favourable to her. She's completely understood that the Praetorian Guard is absolutely critical. So um, it's she who engineers the appointment of Burrus to be Praetorian Prefect. Um, and that, that's going to be very important later on. Um, how does she manage to get rid of him in the end? I heard it was something to do with a mushroom. Ah, well, yes. Um, the story is certainly that, um, uh, well, in, in the year 54, in late October, Claudius dies. Um, there are various different versions of, of how he meets his end. Um, and certainly a, a, a dominant version is that he was fed a dish of poisoned mushrooms. Um, uh, possibly another version is that she bribed a taster to poison his dinner at an official banquet. But certainly um, that the, a, a lot of people clearly um, like to to share the story that Agrippina had been responsible for killing Claudius. She also schemed to get Nero on the throne. <clears throat> Indeed, she did. What yes. did she do? What did she do to get? Because Claudius had a son. So how does Nero come into the story? 
Well, you're absolutely right. Claudius has a son, Britannicus, who's a couple of years younger than Nero. Um, however, uh, Agrippina persuades Claudius that Claudius should adopt her son, Nero. Now, that sounds very strange to us, but actually it's very kind of, uh, that was not, not unprecedented in the Roman imperial household. Um, for instance, the Emperor Tiberius had, even though he had his own son, was also persuaded to adopt his nephew, just to, to sort of have two heirs in the family, as it were. So Nero is adopted by Claudius, um, and as well as that, Nero is betrothed to Claudius's daughter Octavia, and they're married in the year 53. Now, there's, it's a bit weird, obviously, that he's both her adoptive brother and her husband, but they somehow managed to, to kind of get around that. Uh, so, so Nero is very well positioned then, um, and obviously, um, you know, he's, he's older. He's got his, he's had his toga of manhood and so on, um, and so he's in a much better position to take over when Claudius dies in the year fifty-four. At this point, Nero is is sixteen, nearly seventeen. Um, so now Nero is finally on the throne. How does his relationship with his mother fare? Was he under her thumb? Who said that? Well, um, so Nero is really quite young, obviously, at this point, um, and in many ways kind of reliant on his mother, who, after all, is, is, is a kind of a very experienced political operator. Um, so she brings Seneca back from exile, um, and Seneca is has, has been Nero's tutor, um, but he continues as um, the emperor's advisor. Um, so, so Seneca is a very important part in um, kind of keeping the show on the road. And similarly, the Praetorian prefect Burrus, whose appointment Agrippina had secured back in the year 51, um, Burrus is also very, very important. So these two key figures um, are both very much in debt to Agrippina. So she's, she kind of obviously has her own influence over Nero um, and uh, she has you know she she has influence via Seneca and Burris although they don't always agree with her um, and there's evidence for Agrippina's continuing um, importance we can see the way that she's shown on coins so she shown a lot her face appears with Nero on coins there are stories about her listening into Senate meetings and that's obviously very shocking because women clearly have no place in the Senate but Agrippina is kind of listening in nevertheless and Tastus presents that as, as a kind of um, uh, you know deeply disturbing phenomenon um, it's quite wrong uh, that, that, that women should be involved in politics. Um, we also see her shown uh, kind of more positively as a, a, an amazing set of reliefs um, in Aphrodisias in what's now Turkey. And the Sabaste on there is, is a, 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 a kind of monument to the, the, Rome, the emperors of Rome and their cult. Um, and that shows in a series of reliefs, um, amongst those reliefs, there's one showing Agrippina um, putting a diadem on the head of Nero. So, so an explicit acknowledgement, really, of Agrippina's critical role in conferring power on Nero. So, I mean, I think it's quite interesting seeing some, some quite positive and explicit um, acknowledgements of, of Agrippina's role. But then at the same time, um, you know, Tacitus, for instance, really quite critical of the fact that Agrippina is so influential. You know, it's not right for women to have this role. Um, and and it's, it's even more marked than it had been in the case of um, Livia, earlier the the mother of Tiberius um obviously when Tiberius became emperor he was a he was a middle-aged man um but but Nero is young and and um inexperienced so he's very vulnerable really to to being told what to do by his mother what was her fate eventually ah uh, well Agrippina's fate she um uh, now she'd obviously had this enormous influence over Nero but as he grew older he seems to become increasingly impatient of his mother's influence and they seem to have clashed over various things but particularly over his love life um so she um was apparently critical of him for having a relationship with a freedwoman called Acte um and she seems to have been it's Nero who seems to have engineered the death of Britannicus now um Britannicus is Claudius's son, um, obviously someone who um, kind of has a claim to, to the empire himself. 
um, but Britannicus dies um, at, a, at a feast and everyone is kind of totally horrified, but at the same time, they don't want to acknowledge that um, he may have been poisoned because that would show that uh, sort of implicit criticism of Nero. So, um, but the one, one of the people who is most horrified by this is, is Agrippina. She hasn't been involved in this plot against Britannicus. She can see Nero taking the initiative to act against people, close family members. That is not a good sign for Agrippina. So death of Britannicus is a key moment. And, and then in the year 58, um, Nero at this point is still married to Octavia. Um, Nero embarks on an affair with a married woman called Papaya Sabina. Um, and again, um, Agrippina is very critical of this, but it's, it's Papaya Sabina, according to Tacitus, who provokes Nero to get rid of his mother. Uh, so um, there's a, then a, a sort of series of, of attempts to, um, to kind of shake off Agrippina or, or worse. Um, and Tacitus gives a, a very sort of, in a way, quite entertaining account of um, that the initial plot to kill Agrippina, um, she's staying in the Bay of Naples. Um, Nero pretends to be kind of wanting to get back on good terms with her, invites her to dinner and sends her home in what turns out to be a collapsible boat. Um, so they're, they're on this calm, the calm waters across the bay um, and suddenly the boat collapses and Agrippina, and, and one of the things that's really interesting about, about the way Tacitus portrays Agrippina is that she is really smart. She, she works out what's going on really quickly. So she sees the boats collapsing and she just swims away as fast as she can. Um, meanwhile, her, her maid Acheronia, or her friend Acheronia, makes a big mistake. She thinks that she'll get rescued if she claims to be Agrippina. So she says, I'm Agrippina, you know, pull me out of the water. Um, and instead she gets beaten to death with an oar. So Agrippina's in instincts were absolutely right. She's made a speedy, um, a speedy exit. Um, and she pretends that she had no idea that this was a plot. Um, that's been her, her strategy at various times, not, you know, to pretend not to be aware of what's going on, when in fact she does perfectly well know what's going on. So she, she goes back to her villa. She's now pretty scared. Um, but, uh, you know, Nero is, is kind of, determined he's going to get rid of her. So he um, claims that she'd sent a messenger with a, a knife to assassinate him. So, so it's this sort of, um, I know, uh, she's, she's framed really. Um, and in response to this alleged incident, she, he sends um, a messenger, Anicatus, um, to, to go and get rid of Agrippina. And, um, her, the way that Tastus presents her response to this is again really interesting. So she says, um, if, if, if you're just visiting me, um, you can report back to Nero that I'm okay. If you've come to kill me, I can't believe my son is responsible. So, um, so even at this point, she's pretending not to realize that Nero is responsible. But um, then she says, you know, uh, this kind of famous death scene, um, she says strike here and points to her womb. So it's kind of, you know, pretty clear that on that level, she is absolutely acknowledging that Nero is responsible for her death. So she's, she has this rather sort of heroic end. Both of these women seem quite incredible. I mean, I, I secretly wish all these things were true, all these rumours, because they'd be really interesting to talk to if they were. Well, I mean, I think even if they weren't true, that, that, that I mean, the rumours are interesting as rumours, um, but certainly uh, I think they would both have been, um, you know, it, it would be amazing to actually find out their own views of what was going on around them. And one of the most frustrating things is that we know that Agrippina actually wrote her own account of her family affairs um, and uh, Tester's actually made use of this account when he was writing his annals. So one of the stories, the story that um, her mother asked Tiberius for permission to, to remarry, that story, Tester says, he got from Agrippina's own history writing. Uh, and who knows what else was in that history. There's a, there's a, there's a French um, ancient historian, who uh, Pierre Grimal, who actually wrote a, a kind of fictional account of Agrippina's memoirs, um, which, is, which is a very entertaining read. I want to say thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come and talk to us. It's been absolutely brilliant and definitely, definitely, definitely you need to come back on and have another chat with us.
Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a huge pleasure talking with you about Agrippina and Metalida. I can't believe you've crammed so much history into the space of time we had. It's been brilliant. Uh, Join us tomorrow when we are joined by the fabulous Claire Mully, who will be telling us all about uh, female SOE agents during the Second World War. It is absolutely fascinating. Um, Until then, stay safe. If you possibly can, stay inside. This is Nighthawk signing off.